Okay, you ready? This is a story that I, I think it's worth sitting down for. If you're watching me on DVR or on podcast, just hit pause, go grab something to drink, put your feet up, just watch this story. Go with me here. All right. It starts someplace pretty solemn, actually. One of the most solemn, sacred responsibilities of government is taking care of veterans. A part of our bargain with people who fight for this country is that when they come home, we take responsibility for their care, including their long-term care when they get older. We do not leave veterans out to fend for themselves in their old age in this country. We do not abandon veterans in this country. And keeping up our end of that bargain does work differently in different states, but it's something that we have always done. It's a commitment that we all share. So take, for example, this veteran's home. This veteran's home was opened not long after the Civil War. Uh, since the 1800s, this facility, in one way or another, has been a home for veterans who needed a place to live as they got older. Some veterans just needed a little extra care as they joined the ranks of older senior citizens. Some of them needed more intensive care, whether it was for the physical frailties of age or the unforgiving grip of dementia. At any given time, four or 500 former soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines lived in that state home. For those veterans, that home was where they lived, central to their lives. But then a few years ago, that state got a new governor, and the new governor found a way that he thought he could save $4 million a year from that veteran's home. $4 million savings, he figured out a way to get that out of how the state had been spending money to take care of those elderly veterans. He decided he would get rid of the state workers who'd been taking care of the elderly veterans, and instead he would outsource their jobs to a private company. And as you might imagine, the workers were upset. Um, so were the veterans who depended on those workers. A veteran of the Korean War who lived at that state home told the local press at the time, quote, for the life of me, I can't see them getting rid of the caretakers they've got there now. They know each and every person that's up there. Another veteran, a Vietnam War vet, said the caretakers they had were, quote, like family. They're the ones who see us first and tell the nurses and doctors something's not quite right with Tony, something's not quite right with Jack. They go to our funerals. They're not paid to do that. They bring us Christmas presents. The private company people aren't going to do that. Turns out that Vietnam vet uh, knew what he was talking about. And he ultimately sued to try to turn back this privatization scheme. Uh, and his case included stories that make you want to tear your hair out, uh, or at least donate to your fe favorite veterans group. The case included stories of the private company workers dropping an elderly veteran while they were trying to lift him. They broke his neck. Private company workers insisting on feeding one elderly veteran solid food when his doctor said not to. They literally pulled the feeding tube out of his stomach. So the veterans sued to try to turn back the privatization. But the governor had his plan, and the court said the plan could go ahead. And you want to know how that worked out? Yeah. Uh, the state auditor recently looked into how the governor's plan was working out for all those elderly veterans at the state home. They found under the governor's brilliant new plan, the veterans' home was understaffed 81% of the time. 81%. They found the elderly vets were not getting their medications properly. They found staff were failing to even check in on residents to make sure they hadn't wandered off into the streets. They found that when the veterans started complaining that they were being neglected or even abused, no one tracked those complaints or investigated them like they should have been. That's what the state got when this new governor came in with his new ideas about this better way to run things, privatize stuff. It'll be much cheaper, it'll work great. Forget the way you've been doing it since the 1800s. This'll be great. Shut up, veterans. This'll be great. And when it turned out to not work out great, obviously at no fault of the governor, just collect somebody else's scalp. After the state auditor confirmed what veterans had been warning about and suing about and screaming about, the governor did accept the resignation uh, of the member of his cabinet who ran veterans issues for him. So that's one, that's exhibit A. All right, take a breath, settle in. Here's exhibit B, same state, same new innovative governor. Now, this is a state that has one city that's bigger than every other population center in the state by a mile. It has one big world-class city that is four times larger than the next largest city in the state. Uh, as, as, uh, by population, it's as big as the next five biggest cities in the state combined. Right? They've got one big population center in the whole state. You might, you might think of it as the, the crown jewel of the state. And these are the public schools in that state's largest city. 
Black mold spreading through buildings, dead rats in the hallways and the classrooms and the gyms, live rats, and live mice everywhere, mushrooms growing out of the walls, ceilings caving in, floors buckled, floors buckled. Not to mention the lack of books and basic school supplies, that goes without saying. That's the floor in the gym. A few weeks ago, teachers began staging mass sick outs at these schools. Hundreds of teachers called in sick, dozens of schools closed, and the teachers weren't protesting the kinds of things that teachers you know, usually protest in more normal, normal parts of the country. They weren't protesting for a better pay package or something about their contract negotiations. I mean, they do have terrible pay and terrible contract conditions. But what these protesters were protesting about is this. What they were calling out sick and, and picketing day after day was the physical condition of the school that their kids were expected to learn in. They figured, listen, if you want to do it right by the kids, it was more important to take desperate measures to sound the alarm about the physical condition of these buildings rather than keep those kids in those disgusting and dangerous school buildings for one more day. And the amazing thing about this state and its largest city and the condition of those schools is that this school district is under the direct control of the governor. It's not being run like a normal state, right? There isn't a locally elected school board that's running things and that's responsible for things in the school in that city like it is in normal places in the country and in normal states. Now, in this state, the governor took over these schools himself, put his own person in unilateral control of these schools. And under that leadership, with him having taken that responsibility, the schools are expected to be completely out of money by April of this year. Now, the school year does not end in April, but the school year presumably will this year if the district, as it's scheduled to do, runs out of money completely by then. The governor is in charge of those schools. That governor put an emergency manager in, part of, in, in charge of those schools to, to run it for him. That manager resigned from the job last month saying there was no reason for him to stay because he had finished his job ahead of schedule. He wrote this letter to the governor. Dear governor, if an emergency manager determines that the financial emergency that he or she was appointed to manage has been rectified, the emergency manager shall inform the governor. It is from these premises that I am informing you of my intent to leave my position as emergency manager. Everything's fixed. Why stay a moment longer? I'm out of here. The schools are at least partially uninhabitable. They're due to be completely out of money by April. But under this governor, call that Problem solved. Exhibit C, same state, same governor. Uh, in December, the FBI unsealed a five count indictment against an official in a new agency this governor created to cut through all that terrible government bureaucracy and run schools in a new efficient streamlined way, the governor's way. This federal corruption indictment alleged that this official basically used this new agency for bribery and money laundering, including a very lucrative kickback scheme that has now resulted in three guilty pleas in federal court and what's likely to be years in prison for all three felons. It's Exhibit C. Here's a new one, Exhibit D, same state, same governor. See why I told you to grab a pop and put your feet up for this one? This is astonishing. This is all the same state. This is all the same governor. And it's all happening right now. Here's Exhibit D. Do you remember that oil spill last year on the California coast? Pipeline near Santa Barbara sprang a leak. Nobody noticed for a whole bunch of hours. And, and that pipe, it turned out to everybody's surprise, that pipe did not have an automatic shutoff, or at least it didn't have one that worked. And by the time they finally manually shut it off, tens and tens of thousands of gallons of crude oil had spilled out into an absolutely pristine, ecologically sensitive beach. The company that did that, they own pipelines all over the country including pipelines under this river in the same state where our innovative governor has had so much on his hands recently. The company has a couple of century-old pipelines under that river dating back to 1918. And last week, during a big snowstorm, a local woman lives nearby. She was stuck at home because of the snowstorm. And she was Googling around, noodling around online, and she stumbled upon this in the federal registry. It's a request by that pipeline company for permission to start pumping crude oil through those century, century old pipes that run under that river. The company had said they, the company says they had been given permission to do that, to use those pipes for that kind of purpose uh, way back in the day, way back when they built the pipeline in 1918. So now it's 98 years down the road and they're just checking, hey, do we still have that permission? 
we still good to use that pipe for crude oil? What do you think, local residents? You good with a 98-year-old pipe being started up as a crude oil pipeline under your river? I mean, construction standards were great in 1918. I'm sure it will be fine. What could have happened since then? Don't think of it as old. Think of it as vintage. Think of it more like, like an antique pipeline. The public had 30 days to comment on this rather amazing request concerning this antique pipeline under their river. That pipeline, I should tell you, it runs under that river just immediately upstream of the drinking water intake for the state's largest city. Okay, does anybody have any objections? Well, here's the thing about that. Um, apparently nobody has any objections because nobody heard about the public comment period. Nobody noticed. Uh, by the time anybody noticed what this pipeline company was asking to do, the window for public comment had closed. That request for public comment on that bonkers pipeline plan, it got a grand total of six public comments, including two that were just tests that had been withdrawn. So if the nice lady who happened to be Googling around in her house during that snowstorm had not seen the notice in the Federal Registry that day, quite possibly nobody would have seen this at all. And that is a federal issue, right? That's a federal public comment period because pipelines are something that are regulated by the federal government. But you know what? If there was a federal review going on of, of the prospect of running crude oil through a hundred year old pipe directly upstream from the drinking water intake for your state's largest city, don't you think somebody in the state might have noticed that? Other than that nice lady stuck at home because of the snowstorm, noodling around, just happened to be Googling and noticed it in the Federal Register. Yeah, it's a federal review, but nobody at the state said anything or did anything or sent up a flag or even told anybody it was happening. We don't know if they noticed. The public comment period came and went for that absolutely critical and super freaking scary issue, and the state never apparently even noticed. Or if they did, they never said anything. But you know what? They have been busy. Because uh, this state, obviously, is Michigan. And the governor of this state is Rick Snyder. And he's busy right now with the consequences of having lead poisoned the population of Michigan's seventh largest city through another one of his innovation ideas. And while they're working on that, you know, who knows what else has gone by the wayside. There are presidential primaries and caucuses in a few states this weekend. But all the campaigns are basically hunkering down already in Michigan because Michigan's the next big one. And they're going to award a big chunk of presidential delegates in four days on Tuesday. And God bless Michigan. And let's hope the, the pandering they're getting for this fortuitous place they find themselves in the presidential nominating calendar this year, let's hope that pandering does them some good. Because what's as obvious as this broadside of a barn right now in our country is that Michigan is a governance disaster like no other state in the country right now. In a state that ought to be thriving. Think of it, right? With its federally bailed out and revived auto industry, the envy of the world, the biggest and best automakers in the world. You'd think that Michigan would be kind of cruising right now, right? Instead, Michigan is reeling under government-caused disaster after government-caused disaster. It's not like Michigan keeps stumbling into accidents. These are all self-inflicted by the state government. And I know our political debates in this country have to be about something. One day we will wake up and find out they're about this and how to stop it and who should pay.